Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. Today I want to talk to you about a topic that I have become aware of relatively recently, but is very dear to my heart for a number of reasons. Anyway, it's related to this paper called How is LLM Reasoning Distracted by Irrelevant Context and Analysis Using a Controlled Benchmark? So basically the idea here is that if you give a large language model, in other words, a model that can think, you know, or at least a stochastic parrot, if you give it a reasonable question, it will give you a reasonable answer. But if you give it that same question, question with a bunch of irrelevant context or irrelevant information, it will get distracted by that information and can often give you the wrong answer. Why is this the case? Well, the theory here and something that is dear to my heart, which is why I really like this topic, is that in creative writing, especially human beings put in information that helps us to understand something later at an earlier point. The shorthand for this is Chekhov's gun. Chekhov was a famous playwright in the late 19th century. He, along with Stanislavski, was kind of instrumental in moving acting from the traditional melodramatic 19th century mode of acting, you know, the declamatory like, oh, how are you, and things like that, to a more naturalistic style of acting. He's famous for plays such as The Seagull, The Cherry Orchard, The Three Sisters, etc. They are all very depressing late 19th century Russian plays. If you've read or seen them, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, the point of Chekhov's gun, the idea is that if you show a gun in the first act of a play, it's going to be used in the third act. It's something where you're setting things up, right? You're like, the person points to the wall and says, gee whiz, that's a really interesting pistol you've got on the wall there. And then by act three, you're going to have them either commit suicide, something awful like that, or get into a duel. And, you know, bad things will happen because of the gun. And I teach play and screenwriting myself, and I always talk to my students about that. I'm like, you have to leave breadcrumbs of information for your audience. If you're going to do something in Act 3, if you're going to do something later in a movie or a play, you have to set that up earlier by giving the audience bits of information they can chew on. And then when that information comes back around to be important, the audience is like, there's a satisfaction. There's like an, ah, I was expecting that. Because I saw the gun in Act 1, I'm expecting it to be used in Act 3. And therefore, there's a kind of satisfaction on the audience's part of getting that information confirmed. It's like, why did they talk about that in Act 1? Oh, okay now it makes sense in Act 3, it makes sense that they talked about that in Act 1. And my personal philosophy is that human compression, biological intelligence compression is all story based. We are we are just we're storytellers. That's what we are. Even in the sciences and engineering, if you look at Albert Einstein, for example, his theory of special and general relativity, it all has to do with stories. In fact, he said the happiest thought of his life was thinking of a guy falling off of a building, which is a weird happiest thought in his life. But it, it makes sense because he told a story of how this guy falling off the building wouldn't know he was falling, assuming of course, the wind wasn't rushing up against him, that he would be in an inertial framework rather than a non-inertial accelerating framework, and that the earth itself was actually accelerating up towards him. There's a long story to that, but you can see that even, you know, one of the smartest people who ever lived in history and came up with mind-blowing paradigm shifts in science told himself stories. Stories are our compression mechanism. That's how human beings compress information. I'm convinced of that. And large language models, because they have learned from human text and now video and audio, etc., are really, really good at that as well. But the consequence of this is they can also get distracted by irrelevant information. If you put a bunch of junk information into a question, then the large language model can get distracted by the junk information and spit out the wrong answer. Whereas if you didn't give it all that distracting information, it would actually be able to reason through and understand the correct answer. So that's as far as I'm going to talk about this paper. I will leave a link to it in the description so you can read it at your own leisure if you want. What I want to do today is actually test out a number of large language models. I'm going to test Grok 3, ChatGPT 03 and 40, Gemini 2.5 Pro and Flash, and Claude 4 Opus and Sonnet. I'm going to give them logic puzzles that they should all be able to answer quite easily, and then I'm going to give them a large amount of irrelevant information basically in the same question. I'll, I'll reload the pages between each question, and actually what I'm going to do is start backwards. I'll start with the most complicated and distracting version of the question. If they get the most distracting version, I won't even bother with the easier ones because obviously they should be able to get it. But if they get it wrong, I'm going to look at them. Notice that I've tried to get a bit of a spread between reasoning and non-reasoning models to also look at that. ChatGPT 4.0 is non-reasoning, and then Claude 4 is quasi non-reasoning. So anyway, they sort of reason, they sort of don't. It's a little bit unclear exactly how they work. And then the other models are reasoning models. So it will be interesting to see if the reasoning models are actually able to outperform the non-reasoning models in this distracting information, or if they 
all get it wrong. Now, as a side note, I used Grok to help me create these distracting information questions. So it was a combination of Grok and me writing these questions. So if Grok happens to do particularly better than the other ones, it could be that it wrote the questions itself. And even though I'm using a private version of Grok so that it doesn't have access to that memory, it might just be more attuned to the distracting way of writing these questions. So we will see. All right, so let's start with ChatGPT 4.0. This is a non-reasoning version of the model. The, the basic logic question I've tested before is the, the duck question and the minimum number of ducks, because of Scott Walter, can also, the answer can also be five, but the minimum number of ducks is three. So you can see that there's a bunch of distracting information in here. So here we go. Let's see what it looks like. The riddle like sentence says, okay, let's unpack this. So it looks like it's actually doing, okay, three ducks. So 4.0 did perfectly fantastically with this distracting information. Now let's take a look at 03. Note that we're in temporary chat here, so these chats don't, you know, it doesn't really remember things, hopefully. This should be a pretty fresh template, so it shouldn't be remembering things. So anyway, thought for four seconds, got the answer three, so no problem at all so far. All right, next up, let's ask Grok. The minimum, minimum number of ducks is five. That's interesting. So <laughs> the condition is satisfied for duck three, and we only need one. Yeah, so interesting. It got the other answer, which is five instead of three, but it seemed to actually go through that. The smallest number of ducks, the other details uh, do not affect the calculation. So therefore, it was able to understand this with the most you know complicated version of the questions. So just for interest's sake, let's go ahead and ask this question in the non-distracting version. So it also thinks that the minimum number is five. That is incorrect. So interesting that it gets the incorrect answer. When I was generating the questions with Grok, it actually got it right. So that's a fascinating aspect. I don't know why that's the case. All right, now Claude Opus 4. Let's take a look at that and see how it does. All right, it did fantastic, three ducks, no problem at all. So none of these are getting distracted at this point. Very, very interesting. Now, these are kind of classic logic puzzles, so it may just be the fact that they just kind of know the answers already because they've seen them online. It's part of their training data. So I, I don't know. I've got more complicated questions coming up, so we'll see how it does. This is, this is a pretty straightforward and easy logic puzzle. All right, so three ducks. All right, and finally, let's test Gemini. This is 2.5 Pro. All right, 2.5 Pro did fine. And now let's go over and look at Flash. Flash was able to say three. Okay, so all of them got this one right. This is a very easy question. So let's try a little bit harder questions. All right, new chat. This is about eating apples. The answer is C-A-B-D-E. <laughs> I've written that down just to make sure so I wouldn't have to look at it. But you can see there's a lot of distracting information in here. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and copy this into all of them and then take a look, C-A-B-D-E. All right, it got it so fast I didn't even have a chance to go to the other tabs. All right, 4.0 got it perfectly fine, C-A-B-D-E. Alrighty, Grok got it no problem. How about Claude? Claude got C-A-B-D-E with Opus, and Sonnet also got C-A-B-D-E, so they are knocking this out of the park at this point. Gemini Pro got it correct, and Gemini Flash got it correct, so again, they are all correct. All right, upping the ante a little bit more. This is Susan and Lisa playing tennis against each other. The answer is 11 with a bunch of distracting information. I will ask it to all of the models and we will see what the answers look like. All righty, so ChatGPT 4.0, let's see, 11 games. It got it just correct. We've got 11 games for 03. We've got, ooh, eight games for Grok. So Grok has now gotten it wrong twice. Interestingly enough, it was the one that came up with the things. It understands the question, but it's ignoring the irrelevant information, but actually getting the wrong answers. Really, really interesting. Also, we've got Claude Sonnet has gotten it wrong. It has eight games. Again, it's figured out how to ignore the irrelevant details, but gotten the wrong answer. Fascinating. And we've also got eight games from Claude Opus. Fascinating. This is really interesting. Eight games from Gemini and eight games, wow. So a lot of them got it wrong, it's 11. The, it's a very easy trap to fall into that you don't realize that you have to take account of one person winning three games before the other person wins the money And anyway. But uh, that's really fascinating that they understood how to ignore the irrelevant details, but then miss the actual logic of the puzzle. That is very interesting. And just for a quick sanity check, I'm gonna start a new conversation. I'm just gonna use Opus 4 as an example and see if I don't give it the distracting information if it actually figures out that it's 11. Nope, so it actually got it wrong still. So they're just missing the logic part of it. This is fascinating. So they're able to get around the distracting information, but they actually are answering the logic incorrectly. Fascinating, fascinating. All right, next up we have a sock question where the person has 21 identical blue, 15 identical black, and 17 identical red socks. And the question is, how many socks does he have to take out of the drawer if he can't look, if it's in the dark, to be 100% certain he has at least one pair of black socks? And the answer is 40 socks. 
All right, so 40 socks from ChatGPT03. 40 says that there needs to be six socks. Ooh, that is way, way off. So I don't know. It looks like it's figured out the basic idea of the question. So it, it understands the details that are important, but for whatever reason, it completely blows the logic of it. So that's fascinating. Claude Sonnet got 40 socks. Claude Opus, I would expect, will also get, that would be 38 socks, so 40 socks, yes, to be 100% sure. Okay, Gemini Pro says 40 socks, and Gemini Flash said 40 socks. So the only one that messed up entirely was ChatGPT40. I'm going to ask it the easy version of the question without the distracting information. So let's see if it does better. So here we have the without the distracting information. So let's take a look at whether it can get the correct answer if you just give it the basic question. Oh, 40 socks. So it looks like the distracting information, it kind of understood the question, but it got distracted by enough stuff that it was unable to complete the question. All right, next up is the question that if you take out the irrelevant information is the day before, two days after the day before tomorrow is Saturday. What day is it today? And the answer is Friday. So you can see amongst the distracting information here is how many letter R's are in the word strawberry. I figured I'd throw that in there as a kind of a fun little distraction for these models. See if any of them took the bait about that. But as far as ChatGPT03 is concerned, it works out to be Friday. It has the correct answer. ChatGPT40 says today is Friday. That is correct. Grok says the answer is Friday. Claude Sonnet has the answer of Friday and actually helpfully adds that there are three R's in strawberry. One at the beginning and two. That's pretty cool. That's kind of fun that it actually answered both questions. And then Claude Opus also said the same thing. So it actually gave us an answer to both of those questions. Really, really funny. Gemini also did the same thing. It gave us the answer to both Friday and three. And Gemini Flash said the answer is Friday. So these things are knocking it out of the park at this point. They're doing really, really well. And finally, a question about a knight, a spy, and a knave where the correct answer is Alex is the knight, Ben is the spy, and Cody is the knave. And so you can see that 4 actually got it right. Cody is the knave, Ben is the spy, and Alex is the knight. Let's take a look at 3 O3 has Alex as the knight, the knave is Cody, and the spy is Ben, so that is also correct. Grok also gets the answer correct. Claude Sonnet gets the answer correct. Claude Opus gets the answer correct. Interestingly enough, Gemini 2.5 Pro gets the answer incorrect here. Alex is the knight, not the spy. Let's see if 2.5 Flash got it right. Gemini 2.5 Flash got it right. Gemini, this is really interesting. I'm going to give it another attempt at this question. So I'm going to ask in a new chat to sort of clear things out. And let's ask again and see if it gets it right this time. And so this time 2.5 Pro got it right. So really, really interesting. It got it wrong once. I have a feeling that this distracting information does make it tougher for these models, but I have to say overall, the testing indicates that they all do very, very well and are not distracted, which is a contrary result to the paper's results. So one of the problems might be the way these questions are asked. And by the way, notice that there actually is a, a Chekhov's gun in here. There's actually a rusty musket in this one. So I thought that was kind of fun to put in a Chekhov's gun and see if it got distracted by that. It did not. But anyway, you you can see that inside of here, there's a lot of distracting information, then the actual question, then distracting information. So there might be a more clever way of asking this distracting information. And in fact, I think I will do that. I'll try to break the sentences apart and see if I can make it a little more difficult because it might just be too easy to kind of ignore the beginning and the ending and just focus on the middle part. All right, so with that in mind, I've rewritten the question to kind of break apart the information. So let's take a look at how O3 does with this. If it gets it right, then we can look at the other ones as well. So Alex and Cody is the knave and Ben is the spy. So even with breaking the information apart, it was able to get it very, very easily. So let's take a look at 4.0. So 4.0 gets it correct as well. Let's take a look over at Grok. Grok has a lot of stuff. Alex is the knight, Cody is the knave, Ben is the spy. That is also correct. Let's see Claude for Sonnet. Alex is the knight, Ben is the spy, Cody is the knave. Wow, these guys are doing fantastic here. Claude for Opus, Alex is the knight, Ben is the spy, Cody is the knave. Gemini Pro, Alex is the knight, Cody is the knave, Ben is the spy. And finally, Gemini Flash, and it also got it right. So I have to say these models are doing exceptionally well. Now, these logic questions are, of course, part of the corpus of training. Obviously, these things are on the internet. That's where I found them. And so the base logic puzzles are part of the corpus of training. But as you could tell, I added a lot of irrelevant information and the models all did very, very well. There were a couple that got tripped up just a little bit, but they didn't get tripped up too badly, and they overall did very, very well. 
So what can we say in response to this paper? Honestly, I was a little bit surprised. I thought these models, at least some of them, would get distracted by the irrelevant information, but it looks like at least with logic puzzles, they were able to do well. Notice that this paper was about math, and so maybe math questions are more difficult for these models to handle in the first place than logic puzzles, and so they had a harder time. But I've got to say, overall, I think that these models did exceptionally well. This is the kind of thing with all this irrelevant detail that as a human, you'd have to kind of you know weed out the actual question from the irrelevant context before you could actually go about answering the question. So while I found this paper very interesting and I expected the models to get distracted by the information that I gave them, they actually did not, which surprised me. It was not the result I got. Let me know in the comments if there are things that I forgot or I should have done differently to make this test more difficult for these models and to challenge them more. I would love to know. I'm happy to come back and do another test like this in the future. But in the meantime, I have to say that these large language models performed really, really well in my my tests. I'm very impressed. Alrighty, folks, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please do like it and consider subscribing for more of this kind of context, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.